Hey, we are now beginning the book of Job. What an interesting book that we are going to find. Um, as we get into it, there you we're going to see things that we really haven't seen before, ask questions that we might not have asked before, and maybe come away without the answers that we were expecting. The book of Job, uh, some argue, is really the oldest book in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to look at a map here in a little bit, but it's it's there's some just interesting things that take place. Most people think that it is written around the time of Abraham, maybe earlier, that they use the genealogies and different names that appear in the book of Job to be able to get that. But we know that it's early on. We know that none of the characters that are discussed in the book of Job are Israelites. All are non-Israelites. So that's that's really different. And there's really no historical setting for why this takes place. We're really not sure of who the, the off author is. Uh, everything seems to point in the direction of questions about Job's suffering that we're going to read about. And so it's a series of poems of dialogue between Job and his friends about what is taking place. Uh, we also get a picture of, of heaven, of Satan being there. Satan is the accuser, uh, and God allows Satan to inflict suffering onto Job. Why? Well, We'll discuss that a little bit. The real questions that are answered is not about why God allows suffering or why innocent people uh, have bad things happen to them. It's really about the God, justice of God and how he handles things. And so uh, let's go ahead and begin and read the first two chapters in the book of Job. Many years ago, a man named Job lived in the land of Uz. He was a truly good person who respected God and refused to do evil. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pair of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the richest person in the East. Job's sons took turns having feasts in their homes, and they always invited their three sisters to join in the eating and drinking. After each feast, Job would send for his children and perform a ceremony as a way of asking God to forgive them of any wrongs they may have done. He would get up early in the next morning and offer a sacrifice for each of them, just in case they had sinned and, or silently cursed God. One day when the angels had gathered around the Lord and Satan was there with them, the Lord asked, Satan, where have you been? Satan replied, I have been going all over the earth. The Lord asked, what do you think of my servant Job? No one on earth is like him. He is truly a good person who respects me and refuses to do evil. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't he respect you, Satan remarked? You are like a wall protecting not only him, but his entire family and all of his property. You make him successful in whatever he does, and his flocks and herds are everywhere. Try taking away everything he owns, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord replied, all right, Satan, do what you want with anything that belongs to him, but don't harm Job. Then Satan left. Job's sons and daughters were having a feast in the home of his oldest son. When someone rushed up to Job and said, while your servants were plowing with your oxen and your donkeys were nearby eating grass, a gang of Sabians attacked and stole the oxen and donkeys. Your other servants were killed, and I was the only one who escaped to tell you. The, that servant was still speaking when a second one came running up and saying, God sent down a fire that killed your sheep and your servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Before that servant finished speaking, a third one raced up and said, Three gangs of Chaldeans attacked and stole your camels. All of your other servants were killed, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. That servant was still speaking when a fourth one dashed up and said, your children were having a feast and drinking wine at the home of, one, of one, your oldest son. When suddenly a windstorm from the desert blew the house down, crushing all of your children. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. 
When Job heard this, he tore his clothes and shaved his head because of the great sorrow. He knelt on the ground, then worshipped God and said, We bring nothing at birth. We take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes. Praise the name of the Lord. In spite of everything, Job did not sin or accuse God of wrongdoing. When the angels gathered around the Lord again, Satan was there with them. And the Lord asked, Satan, where have you been? Satan replied, I have been going all over the earth. Then the Lord asked, what do you think of my servant Job? No one on earth is like him. He is truly a good person who respects me and refuses to do evil. And he hasn't changed, even though you persuaded me to destroy him for no reason. Satan answered, there's no pain like your own. People will do anything to stay alive. Try striking Job's own body with pain, and he will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord replied. Make Job suffer as much as you want, but just don't kill him. Satan left and caused painful sores to break out all over Job's body, from head to toe. Then Job sat on the ash heap to show his sorrow, and while he was scraping his sores with a broken piece of pottery, his wife asked, Why do you still trust God? Why don't you curse him and die? Job replied, Don't talk like a fool. If we accept blessings from God, we must accept trouble as well. And all that happened, Job never once said anything against God. Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shua, and Zophar from Nema were three of Job's friends, and they heard about his troubles. So they agreed to visit Job and comfort him. When they came near enough to see Job, they could hardly recognize him. And in their great sorrow, they tore their clothes, then sprinkled dust on their heads and cried bitterly. For seven days and nights, they sat silently on the ground beside him because they realized what terrible pain he was in. So we see this beginning uh, taking place. We we can infer some things that we might not always think about is that uh, many people equate that Satan is like the opposite of God. But don't fool yourself. Satan has nothing in comparison to God. Although Satan does have some powers, uh, we see uh, here in Job that he has power over nature to cause certain things. He has the power to inflict suffering on Job. But do not think that that comes close to the power of God. There is no equal to God. If we were going to equate Satan equal with anything heavenly, I would probably be maybe Gabriel, uh, the angel, the archangel, maybe along those standards, but maybe not even that strong or that powerful or that influential. Uh, before we talk about anything else, let's just look at the possible areas that we are looking at. Um, there's not really a solid place where they say Ur is from. Uh, there's usually two places. The big, the, the most common place is down here in the land of Edom uh, is Ur, somewhere in that area, or Syria up in this general vicinity uh, could also be where the land of Ur is. Obviously, it is outside of um, Jerusalem outside of the what will be the tribes um, at some point in the future. Of course, they're not there yet uh, because Abraham has has not settled, we don't think, in that area. Uh, but again, just to give you a perspective, um, uh, there is an Ur in, in Babylonia, but that's not where we're talking about. Uh, Susa is what we just got done reading about with Queen Esther and King Xerxes that had been taking place. So that gives us a kind of a general area of, of what we see. And now we come back to, to just a couple of lessons to, to think about. Um, it mentions that Job is 
blameless. That does not mean that Job is sinless. There's a difference. Job's a good man. I mean, he's just a solid individual. We see that uh, his family gets together and they uh, uh, play and drink and have fun and dance and party. Uh, we see that Job is a good dad. He has raised his uh, kids up. There's a close-knit family. They're loving each other. Things are, are going really, really well for them. In the midst of all that, we see that angels, even fallen angels, uh, have access to, to God. What we're going to find is that per perseverance is a theme that runs through Job. God isn't playing a game with, with Job. I, I want you to realize that God is honoring Job with his confidence and saying that uh, there's no way you're going to turn Job. That's how good of a guy he really, he really is. Uh, but, and there's no evidence that God at any point really comforts Job. So don't think that in our life, when we face hard times or we face affliction or pain uh, or disease or whatever the case may be, that the God owes us comfort of some sort. That's just not it. We find that Job trusted God. Yeah, he had questions and they were legit questions that we're going to find, but he trusts God. We can have questions in our life, uh, but we have given our life to God. So we should be trusting of him. And so as we get ready to go, I, I just want to give you a list uh, as we prepare for this book, uh, a list of Job's afflictions, because uh, right, he lists them at different times throughout this book. OK, he's in intense pain. Uh, his skin is peeling. Uh, he has pus filled sores. He has anorexia because he can't eat. He has a fever. He's depressed. He can't sleep. He has nightmares. He's got bad breath. He has difficulty breathing. He has failing vision. His teeth are beginning to rot. He's itching. Um, and uh, all of those things uh, are are a burden on him that he is going to discuss with his wife and with his friends and with God in the midst of all that. So as we get ready to read the book of Job and we jump into that, I just want to encourage you, no matter what is going on, persevere and trust. Persevere and trust. Have a great day.